Good morning, church. Today is a day that the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. It's a beautiful day. We are on the land of the living, and we have to give God praise and thanks for that. I just want to take this opportunity to welcome everyone here this morning in the presence of the Lord. There is no greater place to be than in the presence of the Lord. We'll now invite Sister Samantha Bullock to open us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to you at this moment and we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful day, Lord Jesus. God, we thank you for your blessings and your mercy. Father, we pray for those that are sick, that you heal them. Those that are sad, that you comfort them. And those that are hungry, that you help them to be fed, God. Lord, I pray that you open our hearts this morning so that we can receive your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, for, thank you, Sister Samantha. We'll now call on Tiana Roberts to do our scripture reading this morning. The scripture is taken from James 4, verses 1 to 10. Let me know when you find it. Okay. James 4, 1 to 10. Okay, here begin it. From whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. He acts and receive not, because he acts amiss, that he may consume it upon your loss. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture set in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusted to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, but gave it grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to happiness. The last verse. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Here end the scripture reading. Thank you, Sister Tiana. I'll now invite the worship team to join me on stage. While I will call on Fija to give you a warm welcome this morning. Fija. She has a special message to give you this morning. Good morning, church. Welcome. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome all of you to this Sunday School Emphasis Day. I hope you will enjoy what is presented to you today and that you will be inspired to come out to Sunday School. So come out, children, old people, middle age, and everyone. There is a class for you. Again, I say, welcome, welcome, welcome. Amen. Thank you, Fija. I'll now invite everybody to stand this morning as you open up your hearts and receive the worship team. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Yeah, that's better. Today is Sunday School Emphasis Day. We are talking about the little ones. You know big ones, you know you are all supposed to be Sunday Schoolers too. Okay? Not the little ones, but also the big ones too. So our first song for this morning, first of all, let us worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, we praise you this morning. Hallelujah. We bless your Hallelujah. name this morning. Lord, we lift praise. you up on high. For there is Hallelujah. none like you, God. You, you call the young because they are strong. Hallelujah. 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 We hallelujah. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. You are awesome in this place. Hallelujah. Our first song, come let us worship and bow down. And little ones, we have to worship God and bow down to him. Amen. Come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Come let us.
Thank you, Lord. He is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah, you, I trust in you. us to trust God, but in Jesus' name, we will trust him. Hallelujah.
if you said goodbye to them, you shouldn't have them anymore. Amen? You should not have them anymore. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. We're going to sing. Remember, today is the children's day. So we're going to sing, Jesus loved the little children. Amen? He loves us big ones too, you know. But he's more focusing on the little ones because he say he called the young because they are strong. Hallelujah. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus cares for all the children. us a promise. I am a promise this morning. Touch yourself and say, I am a promise. Amen. Hallelujah. I am a promise. I am a possibility. I am a promise. With a I am a promise to be 
devil is fighting this morning, but he's on a losing, losing battle. Amen. to do we have to help them in Jesus name let us sing clap your hands all the people thank you Jesus clap your hands all the people shout
We're supposed to clap our hands for the little ones to see. Let us clap them for the little ones to see. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We we'll sing our final song. We are our chosen generation. Hallelujah. Little ones, remember you are chosen from God. Amen. We are a chosen generation. Called for to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me. And I know who I am. We are. We are a chosen generation. Call for to show his excellence. All I require for life, God has given me. I know who I am. I know who God says I am. What he says I am. Where he says I'm at. I know who I am. I know who God says I am. What he says I am. Where he says I'm at.
Jesus. So don't let anyone tell you different. You're beautiful, you're righteous, you're holy. Hallelujah. We'll now turn over. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, worship team, for that. Such a lovely worship this morning. Give them a round of applause. Thank you also to our musicians, our skilled uh, musicians who God has um, installed a, a talent on them. And we have to thank God that they're using it for Christ and not outside in the world. So thank you, musicians. Also, thank you to all our technical persons, our cameramen, etc. Um, moving along in our program, you heard before that today is um, Sunday School Emphasis Day. So as you can see, the Sunday School is taking part in every aspect that is going on today. Next, we have coming up, we have some memory verses. And one of them will be coming from Raleigh Richards. So please welcome Raleigh Richards as he comes. Okay, sorry about that. We will move on to Ralif Richards to do his um, memory verse. Psalms 47 and verse 1 says, O oh, clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Thank you, Ralif. We will now call on Sister Snag to do a little presentation for us this morning. Good morning, church. My task is to talk about Sunday school. Some people think that Sunday school is just for kids. It's not for adults. But that is not true. Sunday school is a place where we learn about God and what he desires for us. Learning is a continuous process. We learn daily. It never stops until the day when death steps in. Hence, there is no better place for the entire family to be than in Sunday school or in church, the house of the Lord, to worship, hear from God, and of course, learn from him in Sunday school. Sunday school is an educational institution that operates on a Sunday. Its main objectives are to enable students to live successfully and obtain eternal life by making wise choices. In Sunday school, students share experiences and develop friendships. They read, recite memory verses, and interact with their peers. Hence, they feel comfortable to ask and answer questions. All classes, from the beginner's class to the adult's class, we all use the same textbook, the Bible. However, class teachers prepare appropriate lessons for their age group. When someone purchases an appliance, it is imperative that he or she reads the instructional manual. that comes with it, so that they can use it correctly, and it will last them for a long time. The person who manufactured that appliance, he knows exactly how that appliance should operate. Hence, we follow his instructions. Isn't that true? So too, God has created us, and he did not leave us ignorant. He provided a manual for us so that we can live successful lives and obtain eternal life. 
if you follow the guidelines laid down in the scripture. In Sunday school, we show and explain Bible guidelines. Our students are taught good values, and I'm going to give you a few. One, to be loving. In Luke 10, the, Jesus told, told the people he was talking to that we must love our neighbors as ourselves. And that was um, portrayed in the Good Samaritan story. And he further stated that we must go and do likewise. Another value, obedience. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3, it tells us about children obeying your parents and you must honor them. If we follow those guidelines, the children are promised long life. So children, if you want to live long, you have to obey your parents and honor them. And the next one I'm going to talk about is kindness to others. Proverbs 28 and verse 27 says, those who give to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to them receive curses. Hence, our Sunday school students should be very loving, kind, and generous, among other things. In a nutshell, they should be outstanding in their communities. Their behavior will be different from those who, do not, who are not Sunday school students. Everyone needs to be part of this experience to hear more of what God wants us to do. Sunday school caters for every member of the family, zero to 100 years. There is no other educational institution that does that. Presently, we have six classes with a highly qualified staff. On staff, we have 11 dedicated teachers, 10 of whom are or were primary or secondary school teachers. But most of all, we are Christians and we love the Lord. I will now introduce the staff to you. To, today, some of our members are ill. I start with the beginner's class, age group two to six. We have sisters Ferdinand, Bacchus, and Richards. Could you kindly stand and wave? Sister Ferdinand, Bacchus, and Richards. In the juniors, seven to 12 years, we have Sister Maloney, the Sunday School Superintendent. And she's assisted by Sister Coombs, who is not here today. Teens, 13 to 17. We have Sister Cambridge and yours truly. Young adults, 18 to 29. We have Minister Bacchus, all alone. Sorry. <laughs> Minister Williams, she's all alone. She's the powerhouse, and she's equivalent to two or three teachers. We have the adults class, 60 and older. Minister Bacchus, he's not here, he's ill. And Sister Haynes. Children under two years, will remain with their parents. They will listen to the, to the language and babble along in the conversation too. The last class is the discipleship class. This is a special class geared for those who have accepted Jesus as their personal savior and are desirous of following him. And Pastor Ferdinand is in charge of this class. We do not only engage in Bible discussions, but we are involved in other activities. For example, in the Christmas season, we have a Christmas party for the children. We have a Christmas program where the children showcase their talent and entertain the members of the community. We also have athletics meet. Every year, March 14th, it's an annual occurrence. We journey to Annesville Plainfield, where we participate with 
all the other churches on the island, other New Testament churches, and have fun. We also have a Sunday school rally, a national annual Sunday school rally. And here the children showcase their talents and abilities. And just recently, we held one at the Lomans Hill New Testament Church. And Joshua represented our church here, there. And the last one I want to mention is refreshment time. Immediately after Sunday school, the students are served the snack. So we cater for the whole man here. You can be confident that your children, your spouse, are in good, good company. They are engaged in healthy discussions and activities. The atmosphere facilitates a successful life and encourages students to serve the Lord. If you are not within walking distance of the church, you have no problem at all, at all. Transportation is provided every Sunday. The church hires a van to transport anyone who wishes to attend. Well, today we have a problem. The van, we have some technical problem. It did not show up today. However, the van leaves, stops primary school approximately 8.45 in the morning and picks up persons along the way. It returns after the morning service to take you back home. Pastor Ferdinand, the Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Maloney, and the staff are anxiously looking forward to having you and your family in Sunday School from today. May God bless you all. Thank you, Sister Snack, for enlightening us about um, Sunday School and what it is. We'll now call back Ralik to do his memory verse. Please welcome him, encourage him. Proverbs 3.11, do not hate the Lord's training. Wow, thank you, Ralik. Thank you. Everybody by know, now, know that we have somebody back with us this morning. She has finally completed her studies in Trinidad and she's back for good and she's eager to give a testimony this morning. So please welcome Sister Trevor. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be back home, of course, um, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, as I said, I was studying in Trinidad for three years. I just completed my degree in um, accounting and finance, and I definitely have to say all praise and thanks to God because if it wasn't for him and his mercies, I wouldn't have been here today. He's kept me through year one, to even to this day, and I'm just so grateful that he has done so much for me on my exams and everything. I'm still waiting on results for some of them, but you know, it's all been good, and I'm happy to be back, of course, with friends and just seeing everyone. Of course, I'll miss them down there, you know, because they're awesome as well. And of course, in it all, we have to keep Jesus in the center of it, and um, also. In terms of that, we know school can be a bit much sometimes, especially like for the youths and so forth. Sometimes we feel we don't want to go to school. We get up and it's real hard to get out the bed, especially when it's six o'clock in the morning and the bed warm. That is something else. But you know, you know what you want and you have to work towards it. You have to achieve it and, and so forth. And even seeing that today is um, Sunday School Emphasis Day, it's good to see the young ones out, you know, they're not just staying home and so forth. But I want to encourage you all, and this goes for the bigger ones as well. Um, sometimes we're there and we're sitting and um, we're hardly doing anything, right? But you have to, there are some things that, you know, 
some people might just say, God, go walk it out, and you just sit and not doing anything. But sometimes you need to praise your way through whatever difficulty there is in your life. You can't sit there. And I'm, I'm, I didn't want to say it, but I'm just, I was standing there, you know, I'm enjoying myself because I'm not studying anyone else. I didn't come here for anyone in particular. I came here for God because I know how much he has brought me through. You understand? And um, just looking around, sometimes you might see the, even the young ones, they're not, you know, being engrossed in it. And it, it, it's something that I think that the parents need to help with because not only sending them to Sunday school and expecting the teachers to teach them everything, it also happens at the home, you know, that's where everything starts. So you must encourage the children to, you know, clap their hands, you know, dance a bit. Um, you encourage them to come to youth group because I, I was here yesterday in youth group and the amount of um, youth that were there as compared to the amount of youth here today, it was, it's more here than as opposed to um, youth group. And that's something that, that's another foundation that we need to help, you know? I mean, Sister Anisha is there and she's trying her best, Sister Shanika is there, as well as the executives. You know, they are trying their best, but it's, it's not just a one-man journey. You need some others to help and push and, and so forth. So I'm encouraging you all to encourage the children, even if you don't have children, you have neighbors, you know, invite them. You know, it's something that they would learn, they would enjoy, they would grow and, you know, not maybe it would have an impact in terms of um their attitudes and you know the violence that you may see it, it may not be as much but it would definitely have an impact so you know encourage those around you and also i just want to leave this um scripture verse that was with me for the past week or so and it's jeremiah 29 verse 11 um, I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of good, not of evil, to bring it to an expected end. Um, that goes for everyone because God wants nothing but good for us. Nothing but good. You might be going through struggles, finances, you, you have all kind of aches and pains, but that is not a reason and that is not an excuse for you to say, praise God. Sometimes your knee may hurt you, your back may be hurting you, and you just can't make it. But just say, praise God, and push. You need to push because you can't sit down and expect something to happen. It would not happen unless you make that move. You need to do something about it. Sitting down and being quiet. I could hear a pin drop when I was sitting there. You need to praise God. You need to warfare in this place and bring it back. You understand? And I just want to just encourage everybody, you know, don't stay where you are. Reach for higher heights and aim for higher things. We have an amazing pastor, an amazing counselor, whatever it is. Work with them, and God will bless you immensely. Your plate will overflow, your cup will overflow, and you would, you'll be like, where is this coming from? But it's all in God's hands, and you just have to commit and work, and I wish everyone a blessed Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Treval. Um, I trust that you have encouraged somebody somewhere in this place today, and even those who are listening to us, they are encouraging in any way from your testimony. And um, you know, some of us, we shy away from doing testimonies, but that is what you need to do. You need to show, show people what God has done for you. Amen? We're going to call on Minister Williams now to do some appreciation for us. She's going to do appreciation for the best attendance and offerings. So please welcome her as she comes. Thank you, Sister Cambridge. The privilege is mine to do some presentation. When you hear your name, kindly come. Um, the first person will be given a certificate of appreciation as the youngest Sunday school student. And that person is Raleigh Richards, my godson. <laughs> It says, the scripture verse, and it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. And 
You would have just heard travel on my nose got soul and bigger as she talk. I am glad she went to um, Trinidad and some of the very things I have been saying from day one when I came here, when she came back the first year, she said, Sister William, you know the same things you were telling us here when I went to Trinidad is the same thing there and now she has come to encourage you again. Come on, get up. And the good thing is Sister Richards is here. She don't send her children, you know. She is here every Sunday with them, except if something happens. So, I pray that more people will emulate her, along with her husband who is on the, the drums. Mr. Richards, please get more involved in the music. You are a trained musician in the jobs. The church invested in you, put it to use. That's me. <laughs> okay. This certificate will be presented to the adult Sunday school class for the most outstanding Sunday school attendance. January to March 2018. Um, could the Sunday school teacher come, please, and the assistant Sunday school teacher, Sister Telma Haynes. Put your hands together as she comes. And the scripture verse is, And whatsoever I do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Colossians 3, 23. I'm not taking up time. I'm not taking up time. But as you know, Sister Haynes has a husband. She has to be nursing. He's very sick. He can't get up out of bed. And yet, Sister Haynes is here every Sunday in Sunday school. So we have much to give God thanks for. Sister Haynes, may God continue to bless you and strengthen you. Okay. God bless you. The next one is for the adult Sunday school Class for giving the highest Sunday school offering from January to March 2018. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, 35b. So, some, can somebody else from this, you want to come or somebody else from the Sunday school class can come? God bless you, and may you follow in your mother's footstep. <laughs> I am here. <laughs> okay, we have certificate present of appreciation presented to Brother Toby for the old male, oldest male Sunday school student for 2018. <laughs> Brother Toby. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6, 9. God bless you. You want to tell us your age? Yeah, he's, um, he's 82. And every, when he's every Sunday almost, he is in Sunday school, and he's 82. And if you want to be strong and vibrant, Come to Sunday school. You'll see how old you will live. <laughs> you live to become. Okay, certificate of appreciation to Sister Thelma Haynes, oldest female Sunday school student. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6.9. And I remember all the up she used to say, me old. <laughs> and I will tell her she's not old. She's not 120 years yet. God bless you, Sister Haynes. <laughs> and last but not least, this certificate of appreciation is for Sister Dalia Maloney for faithful and dedicated leadership as Sunday School Superintendent. 2014 to 2018. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians. Okay, verse 58. <laughs> Sister Maloney, she's such a hard walking person. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate what she's doing here. Eh? She has brought the Sunday school from nothing to something. Although I know as a sister, I know she's still not satisfied. She wouldn't tell you, but I know she's stressed out. She would say, in spite of all that I'm doing, we're giving snack, we're doing that. We go out everywhere she goes, she will invite children. When I go walking for my exercise, we'll invite children. And she said, I'm still not satisfied. And sometimes she's very discouraged. But Sister Maloney, you are doing your very best, and God will richly bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Can we just give the Sunday School Department a round of applause because they're, they're doing a great job and today you're seeing them shine out. So God has really been good and God has been blessing the Sunday School Department. We pray that um, in the future that it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Amen. Now we have a little person with a strong voice because I heard him last night and oh my, he was sounding really good and I know he's going to do great things for God. I'm hearing it in him. He's going to do such a great job for God. So please welcome Joshua as he minister you, minister to you in song.
Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Wow. Great minister for God there. Great worship leader. And pastor starting him off young. God bless you, Joshua. You're going to do great things for God. Hallelujah. Thank you to pastor and to Sister Ferdinand for having him started now in Christ. You are doing a wonderful job. And I speak that he will do great things for God. God is going to bless him. He is going to come up to be somebody great for God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Joshua. Now we're going to move on. We had um, worship and we had some little um, presentation in between. Now it's time for us to open our hearts to God this morning. We saw that we had two little worship um, persons backing up this morning. So thank you to them. Their first time they're coming on. And I must say that they did a really good job, better than me, who has been here for a little while. And you know, we're going to have a new face coming up to present the sermon. And that person is no other than Sister Ferdinand. So please welcome her as she comes this morning to deliver God's word. Thank you, Sister Cambridge. And thanks to everyone for welcoming me this morning. God be praised. Today is being emphasized as Sunday School Emphasis Day as we celebrate the year of Sunday School, the work of the Sunday School. All right? God is a good God. God is a good God. We have to believe that and we have to live that. All right? This morning, I know I have to be short. I'm going to make a presentation on something that was done, that I did in a Bible study, and I was asked to do it this morning. So please bear with me, and I trust that the Lord will bless you as you listen, and you will gain something that will really help you on your walk. Hallelujah. Father, I just want to give you praise. I just want to give you thanks. I just want to say how appreciative I am of you being my great big father. God, as I stand in the midst and I offer myself to present your word this morning, I pray that you will guide me. Let whatever I say be in accordance with your word. Continue to be with me. Continue to be with the congregation as we go through this phase of our service. Bless us all. And when we would have left this place, let it, let it be said that it was a day well spent in your presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus, church. All right, this morning, I'm going to speak on a topic which I gave title, 
I will resist. I will resist. This topic I got from a devotional for women that I normally read on mornings. And on February 14th, the topic was, I will resist. And it gave a short story of a young lady who lived in France. Her name was Marie Durand. She was 17 years old and was waiting anxiously for her wedding day. But that moment never came. She spent that day and many other days that followed in a cold prison cell. You may ask, what was her crime? What could she have done at 17 to cause her to be in prison? And the answer is one that we may not expect. Because if I ask each person present here today to give me an idea as to what they think she was in prison for, I am almost sure that many persons will not think of what she was in prison for, truly. Her imprisonment came as a result of her belonging to a Christian family. Her brother was doing religious work. He was walking about, sharing checks, and giving Bible studies to persons in their community. And he was being sought after. The law was looking for him to arrest him. And when the soldiers showed up at their home, her brother was not there, but she was. And because they did not meet the brother, and they knew that the family was a Christian family, they took young Mary. She was placed in prison, and she was given an option. You either stay in prison, or you renounce your faith in God. What an option. You remain in prison, or you renounce your faith in God and be set free. I asked the question this morning, as young persons and as older persons, what would we have done? What did she do? This young lady, brave and courageous, she knew who she was serving. She knew to whom she belonged. So she chose not to renounce her faith in God, but to remain in prison. And the story stated she did not remain in prison for one day. She did not remain for one year. She remained in prison for 37 years. It did not say what happened after her imprisonment, but at age 54, she would have been let out from that facility. But it did not be, it was not an easy time for her because she had the temptation. She had to oppose the thought of denying her God. She had to oppose all the encouragement from her jailers to deny God and be set free. But for her, she found consolation in reminding herself daily that she will not resist. She took, sorry, that she will resist. She took the opportunity to decorate the prison cell with the words, I will resist. So daily she will write on the walls, I will resist. I will resist. This morning, what are we resisting? What is in our path that we must resist? We are living in a privileged state. We are living in a country 
where we can praise God freely. We are living in a country where we can go almost anywhere or everywhere and speak of the word of God without fear. Without fear of being interfered with. Without fear of being imprisoned. We have that liberty. We have religious liberty. Ask yourself, what are we doing with it? We have it. What are we doing with it? I thought of many nations where the freedom to congregate or the freedom to worship Almighty God is not there. I looked and I found that in China, persons are jailed for three years for simply passing out a Bible. You walk to your neighbor's house and you give them a Bible. Someone from the armed forces sees you or someone from the military sees you and you are jailed for three years. An evangelist, he was given an interview and he said, each year he takes the opportunity to speak with those younger evangelists who work with him to find out from them if they are willing to take the chance, if they are willing to dedicate themselves to the cause, because at any point they can be in prison for the work that they are doing. And he's happy to state that young ones, older ones, everyone, year after year, will rededicate themselves to the cause because they know God is a good God. God is a great God. And once they're in his promise, once they're doing what he wants them to do, his protection is sure. Whether, whether they're imprisoned or not, God will be there to take care of them. That was not the only thing. I tried to look at religious persecution in present day. And I thought of bringing clips, but I don't think some of us have the stomach to take the things that some of our Christian brothers go through in other nations. It is said during a 2018 World Watch List report on Christian persecution that 3,066 Christians were killed. 1,254 were abducted. 1,020 were raped or sexually harassed and 793 churches were attacked. This is a report coming in 2018 from what happened in 2017. And these atrocities are taking place, are taking place in places like North Korea, Afghanistan, China, India, and in some parts of Africa. So I'm asking us today, what are we resisting and what are we doing with our religious liberty? How are we using it to further the kingdom of God? I took the opportunity to question a few of my colleagues on the topic or the question, what are we resisting in our daily Christian walk. And they gave me a list, and I try to categorize the list. This morning, I will present you with a few of the challenges that they presented. And number one is unfaithfulness. I'm going to stop. Pause for a while. Think of it. Unfaithfulness. 
How are we being unfaithful to God? What are some of the things that we are doing that makes our actions unfaithful? In our present day society, it's easy for us to spend time with everyone but God. We spend time with friends, we spend time with relatives, and sometimes with absolute strangers via the medium that we have. But the time for God is not there. When we look at our commitment to prayer and Bible study, how many of us could say that we are absolutely faithful to God in that area? When we look at paying our tithes, are we faithful? And I will be honest with you, when the person told me one of the challenge that they had to resist was the pain of tights. I said, well, I really didn't think of that one. But the person said, that's a challenge in her daily life that she has to resist in her quest to be faithful to God. How many of us this morning are faced with that challenge of tight pain? Indulging in worldly pleasures. It is easy for us to do the things of the world than to really confirm to the things of God. When I look at our society, I wonder who is influencing who? Is the church influencing the world? Or is the world influencing the church? How easy it is for us to invite our neighbor to church without getting an excuse as to why they cannot come. How easy it is for us to attend a function that our neighbor is having at his or her house. A function sometimes that has nothing to do with the work of God. Who is influencing? Think about it. When we look at the word divorce, I'm looking at it in a sense of unfaithfulness to God. Many of us divorce ourselves from the things of God and we get married to the modern technology. We are married to the modern technology. Sometimes we are not only divorced from God, but we are divorced from the persons who are in the same dwelling with us. Unfaithfulness to God. The Bible in the Old Testament speaks of Israel's repeated failure to obey God. It speaks of Israel's refusal to keep his commandments and his statutes. Let us examine ourselves. Are we different than ancient Israel? In 2 Kings 17, 7 and 8, it speaks of the kingdom of Israel, the sins of the kingdom of Israel. And it states, For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, and they had feared other gods, and had walked in the statues of the nation whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. Are we 
going back on God? Are we going back to the things that the Lord would have saved us from? Are we able to resist the devil and to submit to God? The word submission or to submit, when you look at it, it has a very strong meaning. It says to surrender oneself to the control of another. And I know, especially as women, when we come upon this word, submit, it is met with opposition. We are not willing to submit, at least not all of us. We are not willing to submit without questions. We are not willing to submit without receiving answers. But in our submission to God, in our total surrender to God, we know that all will be well. In order to resist the temptations of the day, in order to resist all the ills that will come upon us, we must submit to God. And to really be faithful to God, we have to, we must, have him as part of our lives. The major part of our lives, I will say. Because when we look at our society, like the children of Israel, we are still locking God out. We are still locking him out of our lives. Although we profess to be Christians, we are still not submitting to God and resisting the devil so that he will flee from us. You know, sometimes we allow the devil entry into our lives because of our lack of submission, because of our lack of faithfulness to God. We must submit to God. We must have him as the author and finisher of our faith. He has only good things in store for us. You know, I don't want you to think that I'm against technology. But I see technology as a real hindrance to our faithfulness to God. As Christians, sometimes I'm appalled at the things that we will do using this technology. I still cannot understand why we will be influenced by the world to expose ourselves, expose our lives for all and sundry to see. You know, we spend hours talking with friends and relatives, and as I said before, we communicate with total strangers. We put our lives on the line, as it says, without even thinking all of our lives, all of our activities, be it happy or sad, we are displaying it publicly for persons who cannot help us. We put our problems online. Who is going to help us? Hmm? We put our happiness online. Who is going to rejoice with us? We put whatever is happening in our lives online. And we have thousands of people looking at it and commenting on it. But what do they know about us? What do we know about them? 
We have to resist the urge, the temptation to use the technology in that way. Instead of putting your life on that line, put your life on the line of Jesus. Submit your hurts. Submit your happiness. Submit whatever is happening in your lives to God. He is the only one who can see us through. He's the only one who can help us to get over whatever is happening in our lives. You know, our unfaithfulness to God gives us or heightens our carnal desires. You know, when you exclude God from your life, the only other thing is the things, would be the things of the world. And they come into our lives and they really allow the devourer, the deceiver, to play with our minds. He steals our joy. And he keeps us in bondage. In bondage. As Christians, some of us never feel free. We are always burdened with something. We are always nursing a hurt. We are always nursing a wound. And this is because or it comes as a result of our unfaithfulness to God. The time that we spend, or should I say the excess time that we spend communicating online, catching up with people we don't even know, all right? They really do not care about us. What they care about is the juice that you put online that they can spread to the next person. Use that time to reach out to God. Reach, use that time to rededicate yourself to the worship of God. The Bible study. The prayer. You know, sometimes when we speak of praying some people think that you have to go down in sackcloth and ashes or you always have to be locked away somewhere. You're cooking. You can be faithful to God in praying. You're at the bus stop. You can be faithful to God in praying. Anywhere you are, a thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Lord, see me through this. Is better than nothing at all. The Lord will be with us. He will see us through. So church, let us resist the urge to be unfaithful to God. Let us come back to God in prayer, in reading of the Bible, in doing little things at church. You know, when we do little things, the Lord will honor it and he will cause us to expand and do greater things you know it's it's hard to think that there are things to be done but we are too big we are too high to come down to the level of probably sweeping the church or washing the toilets but God honors faithfulness faithfulness in the little things will mean that one day we'll be established in greater things. Hallelujah. The Bible rarely details these things. If we look at Joseph, you know Joseph was not, he did not start at the top. He started at the very bottom. But as I said before, when you honor God in the little things, God will honor you in greater things. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Another point, another challenge that we face as Christians, something that we must resist is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. 
Unforgiveness is described as a poison. It is described as an aggressive tumor spreading throughout our bodies. It is described as an oppressive chain and a cancer of the soul. And many of us fester this cancer. Even sitting here today, it might be sad to say some of us are deeply affected by this spirit of unforgiveness. And you know, some of us who hold unforgiveness against others, we rarely see it as something powerful. We see it as having an edge over our offender. But examining your physical feelings, your emotional feelings, and your ability to communicate with God when you harbor unforgiveness. Many of us are sick because of unforgiveness. How ironic it is that I am harboring the spirit of unforgiveness against Sister Williams. And Sister Williams is not even aware that she did something wrong to me. Sometimes we conjure things in our minds. Sometimes we add to a simple issue and make it become something so huge that it hinders our relationship with each other. Sister Williams mashed me. I never told her that she mashed me. But in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, she did that for spite. She saw me coming and she willfully walked there and mashed me. And every time I see Sister Williams, I turn my face the other side because she mashed me. And she didn't say sorry. Every time I see her, the tension comes up in my chest. I could hardly breathe. But Sister Williams is ignorant to the fact that I am holding this mash against her. As Christians, we need to have relationship with each other. If someone offends you, please let them know. Sister Williams, you know you mash me. I didn't like it. Let her explain herself and both of us will be free. We'll be free to worship God. Remember, the Bible states that first, for you to be forgiven, you must forgive. And if we cannot forgive, then we are not forgiven. Are we really Christians if we cannot forgive? When I look at these points, these challenges that we have to resist in order to be in right standing with God, sometimes I say we take these things for granted. They seem so simple that we go along living our lives, harboring them within us, not really realizing that these are the little things that can keep us out of the kingdom of God. The spirit of unforgiveness is something that we have to get rid of. And it's not easily gotten rid of because sometimes we go by feelings. I have to feel to forgive you. And if I don't feel to forgive you, then you're not being forgiven. Forgiveness is a decision that we must make. 
we must decide that we are going to forgive. And when we decide that we are going to forgive, we have to seek the help of God. Because the devourer, the deceiver, will try all sorts of things to get you to resist that decision to forgive whoever would have offended you. So once we make the decision, or even before we make the decision to forgive, we have to seek God. We have to let God guide us. Or else we'll be back in the same position. Or this time, we may be worse off because the devourer, our deceiver, he will add more to the hurt. He will add more to the hurt and we will be worse off than when we started. So let us get rid of the spirit of unforgiveness among us. Let us see each other as a brother, as a sister. We have one great big father. And he has a lot of expectations of us. He expects us to be faithful to him. He expects us to be forgiven to our brothers. Because if we cannot forgive them, then he cannot forgive us. He made a huge sacrifice by sending his only begotten son to bear the weight of our sin. So our forgiveness is there. We have to follow his blueprint to obtain it. Forgive your brothers for the small things that they may have offended you with. There is a story in the Bible of a servant who had owed his master a huge sum. A sum that he may not have been able to repay. But the master pardoned him. And you know that wicked man had a servant that owed him a very small fraction of what he was pardoned of. And he refused to pardon the servant. He absolutely refused to the point where his master recalled his pardon and dealt with him. Let us not allow ourselves to be in that position. God has offered his only son to take all of our sins. When our brothers and our sisters offend us by doing something very small that cause hurt in us, let us find it within ourselves to forgive them so that we can be forgiven and we could continue to live a life that is free. Free from physical and emotional distress. Free to serve God at any time. The Bible says, if you come to church, well, it says if you come to the altar to offer your gift, and you remember that you have earth against a brother, what are you to do? Continue offering your gift? No, you have to leave your gift. You have to go and be reconciled with your brother. And as Christians, we have to take these things seriously. Seriously. We carry on things for too long. Simple things between brother and sister, we carry them on for too long. Let us depend on God, make the decision to forgive, and live a life free of unforgiveness. God is good. God is good. Some of us, 
as my colleague would have said, we struggle to resist covetousness. That's a struggle for us. Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Bible Theology describes covetousness as a strong desire to have that which belongs to another. A strong desire to have that which belongs to another. Young people, older people, we have to learn to be contented. In whatever state we are, we must show contentment. A lot of our young people get into serious trouble because of the desire to obtain that which they cannot afford. Older persons, we get into a lot of financial difficulties because we want what our neighbor has. Christmas is coming. Sister Snag has a two-door refrigerator. And her two doors, one is on the left and one is on the right. I do not have the financial means, but I want a bigger two-door refrigerator. And I don't want door on the left and door on the right. I want door on top and door at the bottom. I want freezer below and fridge on top. How am I going to pay for this? Hmm? Sister Snag knows how she's paying for hers. It could have been a gift from somebody. The pastor said it's paid for already. You know, it could have been a gift from somebody. You don't know how people obtain what they have. We have to be content with what we can afford. I've seen too many young persons go down the road of destruction because they do not want to walk with the frozen bottle of lime juice and the bowl of pillow that their parents would have provided for them. They come bearing KFC, Bickles, and Subway. And they come bearing it, for those at school, they come bearing it after the one o'clock bell. So it took them an hour to obtain this, which their parents could not afford it. And then you ask, where did you get it? How did you obtain it? I went by my daddy for getting money to buy it. Hmm? So, where is daddy? What is daddy's number? Daddy ain't have no number, you know. You can't find where daddy is. When we look at the devices and parents, we have to be very, very careful what we give to our children. I am not a person for cell phone, but I have children. I had a cell phone before the one I have now, and I had children asking me, Miss, them phone the day? You know, Miss, them phone the day? But I'm comfortable with my phone. Some children show up with some phones bigger than the palm of my hand. 
And I can't tell you of the names. Probably if I call Jada, she might be able to tell you of the S what and the what that. But we have to be careful what we expose our children to. As I say to children and to young people, it is not always that you will be in the privileged position that you are now. We wake up this morning and mommy is healthy and strong. Daddy is sailing. He could send you 600 US for your birthday. What happens if there is an accident? Something goes wrong with daddy. He cannot pay the bills. Mommy is not working. What are you going to do? Who, are going, who is going to give you the things that you are coveting? Because some of the things that you desire, you really do not need them. We really do not need them. And we look at these things in our everyday lives. But then again, if we go to the Bible, if we become more faithful to our Bible studies, we will see that God is speaking against these simple things that we think they are not affecting our lives. In Exodus 20 and verse 17, the Bible forbids coveting anything that belongs to a neighbor, including his house, his wife, his servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything. It says anything that belongs to him. So even if you see your neighbor's wax apple tree breaking down with wax apples and you want it, you desire it, you desire it more than your neighbor, you know. You desire it to the point that you're going to steal the man's wax apple. And the Bible speaks of this. It says, covetousness is the root of all kinds of sin. Murder, adultery, stealing, lying, idolatry. Any type of sin you can think of. Your desire, not just your desire, but your strong desire to obtain something that is not yours can cause you to do anything. Is covetousness have people breaking into our homes and taking out what we have? Is covetousness causing them to murder us when we try to stop them entering our properties? Do you think they really have need for the things they want to obtain from us. But they're using what they rub us off to fill the need that they have, most of the times, for money. So as Christians, let us not continue in this vein. Let us free ourselves of the desire to have what our neighbors have, even though we don't need it. Young people, your parents, they're trying their best to provide for you. They're offering you an opportunity to educate yourself so that you can obtain what you want in the future. Be contented with what they offer you. If it's bread and cheese, take it. 
If it's water and sugar, take it. You never know what the person you approach to get something better or something that you think is better than your parents is giving you what they will desire of you. How is your life going to be affected by that desire to have more than you actually need? Because mind you, what your parents give to you will satisfy your nutritional needs and will hold you until you get home. But what you are going to buy will cause even more health issues than you really anticipate. And it has a tendency, the process by which you obtain it has a tendency to give you emotional stress because you may not be able to deal with the effects that will occur after you would have done what you had to do to obtain what you think you needed. So let us just hold fast to the word of God and really submit ourselves to his presence. Resist the spirit of covetousness. Resist by submitting yourself to God. And the devourer, our deceiver, once he sees that we are serious in our submission to God, he will flee from us. He will let us go because we belong to God. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised in everything that we do, in everything that we say. And as Christians, we have to hold fast. We have to separate ourselves from those persons who are not Christians. When we say separate ourselves, we cannot live in a world by ourselves. But what we do should be different to what they are doing. We should not be numbered as our unsaved neighbor. And this brings me to a point that as Christians, we allow ourselves or we allow the deceiver to pull us in. Pull us in. One of my colleagues said, on a daily basis, she has to resist the temptation to speak evil of others. Gossip. And when I look at the term, it can be defined as giving information about the behavior or the personal life of another person, often without knowing the truth. And often revealing things that you really know nothing about. And if I ask you to reflect on the past week as a Christian, was this a challenge for you? Did you have challenge? resisting the urge to speak ill of your sister. As Christians, we put ourselves in positions where we hinder the progress of God's kingdom. We 
put ourselves in positions where we hinder the progress of God's kingdom. But why is Sister Ferdinand saying that? No. You and your Christian sister, y'all you you have a disagreement. Something did not go right about one issue. But instead of finding your sister and discussing the issue, you go on to your unsaved neighbor and we're telling the unsaved neighbor all that we know about our Christian sister. How she ain't no good. How she did that last year and she did this this year. And how she thinks she this and she thinks she that. Now tell me something. Is this the same unsaved neighbor? You're going to wake up next Sunday morning and try to invite to church? Think about it. If I, as a Christian, can go to an unsafe person and ridicule my Christian sister, what respect is that unsafe person going to hold for me? the God that I serve, and the church that I attend. Hmm? Think about it. If we cannot live peaceably in church, if we cannot promote wholesome behavior, how can we influence the unsaved world, to become Christians. Think about the things that we do that hinders the progress of God's kingdom. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, it says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. Okay? So instead of spending our time speaking ill of each other, or trying to magnify our neighbor's problem, let us find scripture verses that can speak to what they're facing. And trust me, there is a verse in the Bible for everything that you can think about. Many verses. I plug in the word unfaithfulness, and I got thousands of verses. Thousands of times this was mentioned, especially in the Old Testament. So, there is a verse... For the hurt, there is a verse for the soul point, and we must follow the word of God. Let us edify each other instead of using the little things, the, mis the little mishaps that we have in our lives to bring down, pull down, and break down one another. You hear me? Sometimes we wonder, why is one so ain't coming back to church? Reflect. Reflect. Sometimes we unwittedly or unintentionally drive people away from the house of God because we are not exemplifying the Christ that we preach. I know I have to finish. Time is going. But we have to look at the God that we are serving. What he expects of us. 
he says, to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. How could we go into the world to preach the gospel when we are not living the gospel? Sometimes we don't have to speak. Our lives testify of Christ. So let us not just let our lives testify on Sunday mornings, but let us allow our lives to testify of Christ's goodness on a daily basis, an hourly basis, as we live. Today, we do not have the pressure of religious persecution. One day, we may have, but today, we do not. So let us live our lives as the perfect example of who Christ wants us to be. Let us deal with each other as brother and sister of the same heavenly father. Let us be faithful to God. Let us forgive each other. Let us be contented with what the Lord allows us to have at the point he does. And let us encourage each other to be better individuals than bringing down each other and causing us to fall away from the kingdom of God. I pray that the Lord would have revealed something from this message to you to hold on to. And I pray that your week will be a week that you will not have to put so much effort into resisting, but you will submit yourselves to God and he will do the rest for us. Praise the name of Jesus.